I just want to say thank you so much to Dia for uh, inviting me to come and speak with you today. Dia has long been a personal hero of mine and her work has been instrumental in helping me to understand and recover from some important aspects of my own experience. So thank you, Dia. Um, when I was on the plane coming into Bergen, it struck me how little I know about this beautiful country and that if most people didn't speak English and if they weren't as friendly, then I'd have a pretty tough time getting by. Acclimatising to experiences that are unfamiliar to us is part of life and it can be so exciting to expand our view of the world and to meet new people to share that journey with. But it can also be incredibly scary if we lack the means to communicate and be understood. In the most extreme circumstances, we may often wonder if we'll be able to survive at all. Alienation is a word that we've been seeing with increasing frequency in the press over the last few years, most often in relation to young men at risk of radicalization. What we hear less about is the devastating impact of alienation that occurs when victims of honor abuse and forced marriage escape their terrifying ordeals and attempt to build a new life for themselves. When I was 12 years old, growing up in central Scotland as the youngest of seven children, I was helped by my two elder sisters, who were only 27 and 28 at the time themselves, um, to escape from abuse and the threat of forced marriage. They were only 16 and 17 when they were told by my parents that they would be going on holiday to Pakistan. And when they got there, they had their passports taken from them and they were shown pictures of the men that they would be made to marry the next day. They'd already suffered a lifetime of astonishing abuse and exploitation. And when they could see that there was every chance that I'd be made to suffer the same fate they did, they contacted social services, the police and solicitors and the children's panel and the psychologists um, to ensure that I was safely removed from the family home. A date was set for me to leave, and in the few weeks beforehand, while custody hearings and legal aid provision were being arranged, I smuggled what few possessions I could, little by little, out of a back window and into a waiting car. I honestly believe that if it hadn't have been for early police involvement that was both swift and sensitive, then my parents would not have hesitated to punish me further for shaming them by attempting to escape. But I was lucky. Even though social services did make a very big mistake in advising that I maintain contact with my parents, I was now free to live as I chose. There are too many others who have no safe place to go, who might not have the ability to find a job or to advocate for themselves in court or to carry out even the most basic personal administrative tasks. I was free, but to be honest, it certainly did not feel that way. The world as I knew it had been completely obliterated. And to say that I felt lost was an understatement. I was broken by it. And my family was torn apart too. So the year after my escape, I attempted suicide. I overdosed on painkillers and ended up in hospital for a week. And everyone was confused. The worst part was over, surely. But for me, it was only the beginning of years of desperation and depression. In 2011, I was diagnosed with two mental health disorders, borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder, which explained my lifelong battle with deep depression and regular suicidal feelings. There's no way that my experiences did not contribute directly to those diagnoses. So when you're raised in an abusive environment, you're taught that you are worthless, that your thoughts and feelings and desires are not only irrelevant, but laughable as a concept. And because you aren't allowed your basic right as a human being to acknowledge the existence of personal boundaries, they end up being constantly transgressed. And of course, without the right support, this dynamic continues beyond the bounds of the abuse that you've escaped. For me, to go from such a sheltered, abusive upbringing, where every aspect of my life was under strictest control, to suddenly being out in the world and having to make my own choices was not only overwhelming, but at times unbearable. 
sorry, is there a tissue around at all? <laughs> um, I started drinking a lot. Alcohol was such a taboo in our house, and I thought I was enjoying my freedom to rebel, when in fact I was actually self-medicating to numb the pain of emotional chaos inside. So what you have is a young woman in her late teens, early 20s, who has, thank you so much, who has undiagnosed and therefore untreated mental illness. With no knowledge of how to assert personal boundaries and who is rebelling against past abuses by placing herself in harm's way. During those few years, I was raped three times. It's been 20 years since I escaped my situation. Over that time, I gradually ceased all contact with my family except for one sister. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the youngest of seven and I'm an auntie 11 times over. It's very difficult for me um, to describe and do justice to the experience of being estranged from family. Uh, many other victims have to cut contact immediately with their entire families all at once. And for some, it can even mean cutting contact with entire communities in order to ensure their own safety. It's not just the feeling of profound sadness that the mother and father who raised me or the siblings I played with, shared secrets with, or created some of my most Im important memories with were no longer in my life. It wasn't just the anger that when crisis hit, as it has so often done over the years, I often had no one to turn to until I made new friends who are my family now. It wasn't even the constant underlying guilt that everything I did was proof of my inherent badness because the voices of relatives who, when I was young, told me I was somehow dirty for having a crush on a boy or because I wanted to dance to music like my friends were enjoying. Those were the voices that had now taken up residence in my head as my only connection to them. No, estrangement cuts deeper than all of those things because it fundamentally changes your sense of self and your entire identity. My sister, the only member of my family that I'm in contact with now, describes it as nothing short of psychological death. It's little wonder then that even when a victim of honour abuse and forced marriage has miraculously somehow found a safe place to live and is able to function on their own, that many will still return to dangerous situations. I'm glad to say that I've come a long way from the depression and darkness of those early days. If it hadn't have been for many years of therapy, I would not be able to stand here and express a strong and sincere belief that life is not only worth living, but it can be a joyous experience, even after all of that. Don't get me wrong, I still have my good days and my bad days. Um, it was only in June uh, that I last felt a deep compulsion to, to self-destruct. And I'll need to use the skills that I've learned to cope and function for the rest of my life. I accept that. Right now, uh, I'm glad that I'm in the middle of an 18-month treatment program uh, of mentalization-based therapy, um, which is very effective for BPD. Um, and as is the case with each type of treatment I undergo, my life and well-being improves remarkably. And now that I've been able to gain enough distance with the passing of time from my own experiences, with the help of people like Dia and Diana and an increasing number of others, thankfully, I realise my situation is by no means unique and that it's actually the continuation of a generational problem that we now have the power to shift and change. My parents were abusers and there's no doubt in my mind about that nor do I think it will ever help me in any way to have them involved in my life in any capacity. But I can understand that they were also abused and they are, were the product of their own terrible ordeals. I now know that my father was also affected by honour issues. When his father died, his brother took over as head of the family and his mother remarried. According to my uncle, this brought shame upon the family and he forbade my dad from visiting her. Despite this, he went to visit her anyway. My uncle threatened to kill my dad and they never spoke again. I'm told that my uncle's last words to my dad when he left Pakistan for Britain were, if you or any of your children ever set foot in Pakistan again, I'll kill you and I'll kill them. Mm -hmm. 
The term forced marriage implies that the right to choose your own partner is acknowledged but has somehow been ignored. My mother never had the luxury of ever dreaming that she could make her own choices. Her photograph was one of three sent to my father by his sister with a note asking which woman he wanted to marry. He chose her and off to England she went. As painful as my experiences have been, I can say with a good amount of confidence that forced marriage, in my family at least, is not something that I or any of my siblings or their children will ever experience again. We acknowledge that, my parents, that what my parents saw as tradition or the way things just had to be was in fact abuse, and this, this is the first step. We started to believe that we had a right to our own personal choices, whether it was a choice to get an education and pursue our own careers, or our choice of friends, and most importantly, the choice of who we married, if at all. But victims of honour abuse and forced marriage need much more than the strength of their own conviction to escape the incredible powerful force of their own families, some of whom will stop at nothing to bring their own children into line. Emotional blackmail, psychological abuse and, of course, brute violence are all part of their approach. They may withhold money or possessions that rightfully belong to the victim, so they have no chance of successfully surviving on their own. In the most extreme cases, they'll think little of simply making sure the victim disappears altogether. My dad was seen by most as a fine, upstanding member of the community. He was always polite to everyone he met, he paid his taxes on time, and the thought of him ever getting on the wrong side of the law would have been laughable to most. And my mother, who was seen by all as a bit of a meek, nervous character, was, behind closed doors, terrifying to all of us. I get incredibly frustrated when, at times, I hear that these issues must be dealt with in our own communities. How is that supposed to happen when often it's entire communities that are complicit in the abuse? I look back and consider where I would be now if my sisters hadn't been believed and helped by the authorities. The one who approached police in the first place and had herself already been forced into marriage and at that time was pregnant with her first child. During a routine appointment with her GP, her absolute terror at the thought of giving birth came out. I now know that in clinical terms, this is known as tocophobia. Her GP referred her to a psychologist who very quickly realised that all was not well in this young woman's family life. If it wasn't for his support, she would never have gone to the police. If he had been afraid to intervene for fear of appearing racist, I would not be standing here, most likely. The same goes for the police, the social services and everyone else who is involved. We didn't have the luxury of having someone in our own community who believed we mattered enough to act against our abusers. So whatever walk of life you're from, or whatever sector you work in, you can all be part of the solution by understanding that anyone can fall prey to abuse. That it's not racist to offer a listening ear to someone that you're concerned about, or to provide emotional support. And that everyone has the right to live life on their own terms. So part of the work I do now um, is uh, a lot of advocacy work with um, several charities in the UK, and I also love to write. That was actually what I started um, uh, doing uh, and loving the most. I studied uh, English and creative writing at university, um, and I was writing a book about some of my experiences, um, and Dia very kindly said I could read a little extract out. So I'm going to read a short story about a simple, a, a simple holiday I took to a sunny place with a beach. Curls of water ripped up, rippled up the golden white sand to kiss the tips of my toes. I painted them a deep scarlet to go with the red trim on my bright white surfer's bikini. Not that I could even swim, never mind surf. But no matter, I so rarely got to meet the sea that I simply stood in awe whenever I saw it, and that was enough. The sun shone cloudlessly on my bare skin, warming my body to its core. Since my escape, the feeling of sunshine on my naked belly made me feel like a thief on parole with her hand in the till. But I was no criminal, and I could do now what I pleased with whomever I chose. There was no one here to warn me or threaten me or push me out of sight of prying eyes and gossiping mouths. 
A little way off, couples and families who had settled closer to the resort for the day laughed and played and kissed, applying sun cream every once in a while, caught up in the serious business of relaxation and fun. I could only just hear their voices, carried along by the slightest of breezes. Occasionally, the lifeguard would wander past, and I would catch myself thinking for a split second that I was going to be taken away, that I had been found out, exposed as an imposter who didn't belong. For someone like me to think for one minute that this kind of paradise could be mine would once have been a lurid crime in itself. But then the lifeguard would give me an appreciative smile and walk on, leaving me to my sunshine and dancing at the water's edge. Freedom takes some getting used to. Thank you.